<coughs> okay, I think we'll get started. Um, right, good morning everyone and welcome to the joint webinar with the University of Glasgow, the Geological Society of London and the European Federation of Geologists on the topic of hydrogen on transport day at COP26, a silver bullet or a red herring. Thank you very much for joining us. We've got an amazing panel today. Um, the first panel talking about sequestration and a second panel talking about natural hydrogen before an in-person panel later. Um, my name is Florence Bullow and I'm the Head of Policy and Engagement at the Geological Society. Um, we're a society with um, around 12,000 fellows who are all geolog practicing geologists and we I work in the external relations team with my colleague Megan working on the areas in which science policy and geoscience um, overlap. So we've been working a lot on hydrogen recently recently published a hydrogen economy um, briefing note. You can see the URL on the main screen now if you want to um, have a read that or have a look at any of our policy work. And we've also done a number of activities and work around COP, um, which you can find on our website forward slash road to COP if that interests you. So I'm going to hand over to Amanda Owen at the University of Glasgow, who's going to chair this first session. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy. Thanks Flo, yes, yeah, so uh, welcome everyone. So this is uh, our first panel, which is on the theme of carbon sequestered hydrogen and hydrogen storage. So on this panel, we've got a series of experts who will be um, presenting and discussing themes relating to uh, large scale subsurface, uh, particularly in terms of storage of hydrogen, uh, hear about existing schemes and discuss emerging areas relating to hydrogen as well. Uh, so I'd first of all like to um, thank everyone for coming along and for our speakers agreeing to talk and I'd like to introduce our first speaker which is Catriona Edelman from uh, Edin University of Edinburgh who's going to be talking about geological storage of hydrogen for net zero um, specifically an update from the, the High Store Poor project. Okay so over to you Catriona. Thank you Amanda uh, I shall just share my screen. Hopefully that you can see now on my screen the slides. Yep. Perfect. Okay. That's lovely. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you, Amanda. And I also do highly recommend the um, the Joel Sock Hydrogen um, document. It's a really, really nice body of work. Uh, well, well, um, yeah, well presented. So I certainly recommend you you read that. Um, so yeah, my um, yep. As Amanda said, my name is Katrina Edelman. I am the Chancellor's Fellow in Energy at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and also the Energy Technology Partnership um, Deputy Hydrogen Theme Champion. So I am a fan of hydrogen, but, uh, but realise its limitations and, and we'll explore some of those today. Um, so a geologist by training, and I'm currently working on two funded projects that are looking at the feasibility of large scale geological storage of hydrogen in porous rocks. So that's the EPSRC funded high store pore project, uh, which I'm going to give you a little bit of information about today and also a new um, Horizon 2020 project, uh, the High Use Pre project. So that's a kind of European consortium of, of, of academics and industry that are looking at this project across Europe. Um, I'm also involved in another project for uh, working with SGN actually, and we're mapping the geological locations of offshore and onshore um, storage options, really with the aim of building a kind of open access GIS based database uh, of hydrogen storage maps for the UK and, and really linking that to the infrastructure and assets so that we can get a, a kind of full picture of that whole energy system and, and where that storage sits in with that because uh, I think that's quite important to, you know that that idea of, of where the storage sits in, in our future energy systems and whether we'll be centralized whether we'll be decentralized so we need to kind of explore all of the options that are available to us so yes yeah, so I'm really delighted to kind of have the opportunity to present some of this work to you today and, and some of the, the findings that we've been um, that, we, that have been coming out of the High Store Poor project, uh, where I'm kind of joined by a hugely talented team of researchers um, at the University of Edinburgh and indeed in the wider academic community. Um, and, and, uh, and also important to highlight that need for these interdisciplinary collaborative research that, uh, you know, hopefully these discussions will, will instigate. Uh, and, and hopefully we can touch on some of these in the discussion session. So yeah, I mean, we, we know the problem we're facing. You know, three quarters of our greenhouse gas emissions are, are related to energy in some form or another from industry, transport and domestic use. And while really good progress has been made in reducing our emissions through energy efficiencies and increased renewables, of course, it's unlikely to be enough to reach our net zero targets, particularly in these hard to decarbonize areas such as 
transport and industry. And we do need these further decarbonisation op options or pathways. And, and hydrogen is currently kind of the new kid on the block. And is so, well, it's, it's not new at all. It's been <laughs> around as an energy uh, for a long time, but it's certainly been um, increasingly um, included in the um, in the net zero um, climate change modelling um, as an alternative to fossil fuels that can help us achieve that deep decarbonisation of, of energy to reach our net zero targets. Um, because hydrogen can do two things very well. It can it can sort of support the increased renewables by providing that large scale energy storage to help us meet the variations in energy demand between the summer and the winter and provide backup energy during extended periods of, say, low winds. Um, and it can tackle these hard to decarbonise areas. So it can replace methane in the gas grid um, to decarbonise heating in our old housing stock in industry areas where maybe electrification might not be so easy to do. Um, it can deliver that necessary range for long distance transport, shipping and aviation, um, which batteries may struggle. Uh, and it can replace some of these hydrocarbon based industrial processes, such as those used in steel making, which, which contribute a significant amount to our, our energy use and, and in turn our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but it is important to highlight, you know, I hope I highlight that a lot, is that hydrogen isn't really the single solution to everything. Um, it, you know, it's really more about finding its place within the future energy system and, and, and it, you know, it will play an important part when deployed, deployed strategically to decarbonise these areas that are currently difficult for electrification to reach. So, um, you know, it's certainly not that solution to everything, but it is um, it will play a part. Um, so, yeah, to look at that kind of hydrogen landscape, of course, that the Paris Agreement led to over 30 countries setting out hydrogen policies. And we now have around $300 billion or something worth of, of clean hydrogen projects already underway or in planning. So there is action happening in this. Um, you know, and, and within the UK, all of our climate neutrality scenarios to meet net zero by 2050 include a growing reliance on hydrogen. Uh, and of course, this is backed by the recent publication of the UK hydrogen strategy, the Scottish hydrogen policy statement, the inclusion of growth of high, low carbon in the green temp, in the 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution and the North Sea transition deal, which will be supporting the transformation of the oil and gas sector to a net zero. So it's it's increasingly playing a part in our in our forward looking policies. Um, and a particularly effective driver of these hydrogen economies or, 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 or the hydrogen clusters or valleys. Uh, and they create these sort of little mini hydrogen economies where you, you can gather everything together and really enjoy these economies of scale and, and multiple use of uh, uh, and sharing of resources. So there's around about 30 hydrogen valleys across the world. Um, and the UK has recently committed to supporting two of these. Um, basically to carbon capture and storage and low carbon um, hydrogen production industrial clusters. So that's the East Coast cluster around Teesside uh, and the Humber and then the high net low cluster in the northwest around Liverpool, in addition to the existing industrial clusters that, that are already growing around the UK. Um, and these clusters will be supported by a, wide, a, you know, a really a, a very wide number of hydrogen demonstration projects across all of the applications. So heat transport, uh, you know, there, there's a really there's a wealth of demonstration projects happening across the, the UK and around the world, really. Um, so two things that come to mind really are the SGN's H100 project, uh, which is going to be supplying over 300 households in Fife with 100 percent green hydrogen uh, for their cooking and heat to really show that that use of hydrogen. Um, in, in a domestic setting and of course the hydrogen buses uh, and refueling stations in Aberdeen uh, where people again are just getting used to the fact that hydrogen is, is powering their buses and, and, and it becomes every day and, and quite normal. So, so these are really good demonstrations of, of, of the safe use of hydrogen within people's life and, and increasing that kind of acceptability and, and how people and that familiarity with, with hydrogen. Um, so so, so the, the landscape is quite exciting. Um, but of course, we're geologists and we think, well, why, why do we need geology in this, you know, in this hydrogen economy? Well, you know, we really do need our geology in, in the uh, in, in this uh, in this hydrogen um, economy if, if we're to move to scales that we need uh, to support the energy transition for net zero. So if you look at the figure on the screen, uh, this shows discharge duration against storage capacity uh, for hydrogen. And we can see that surface tanks can deliver kilowatts to megawatts for minutes to hours. Um, which results in about in a storage capacity of around about 10,000 kilowatt hours at the most, um, which is which is really the average gas usage for 
um, for a single UK household per year. So we're going to need a lot more storage than that that can be held in surface tanks if we want to reach net zero. And geological storage is really the only current feasible option for these scales of storage that we need. So this, of course, ranges from engineered caverns and suitable rocks through dissolutioned mine salt caverns capable of gigawatts of storage discharged over days to week, weeks and ultimately onto storage in deep porous rocks such as our depleted gas fields and saline aquifers, which can hold terawatts of storage with discharge from weeks to months. So these are the real scales that will be required if, for example, we were to replace natural gas with hydrogen for heat as an example. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I think geology is going to be a really important kind of enabler of that hydrogen economy. Um, so now we need to think about, well, well, how are we going to deal with this and, and how experienced are we in, in using this? And we have, you know, we have a massive experience in using our subsurface geology for natural gas energy storage. Um, there are around about 670 store natural gas storage facilities around the world storing about 1000 terawatt hours of natural gas in operation around the world at the moment. Um, and we, you know, we also interestingly have some experience of geological storage of hydrogen. So we know that underground natural gas storage is a well-established technology. But, but what about hydrogen? So that's been, uh, yeah. So we do have some experience of that. We've been storing hydrogen in salt caverns in Teesside actually for the use in the chemical industry since the seventies commercially. Um, and we developed some really good experience when storing the town gas, which was made from from coal. Um, and was about 50 to 60% hydrogen and methane and CO2 and, and, and other gases. Uh, and this was stored in deep sea land aquifers in France and Germany and the Czech Republic in the 60s and 70s, uh, before, of course, the North Sea gas came online and, and displaced the town gas, which we were using to uh, heat our homes um, before the, the um, natural gas came on stream. We also have two interesting ongoing pilot projects. Now, these are looking at biomethane production from hydrogen and carbon dioxide um, through bacterial conversion in the subsurface. So their energy and then putting it in the subsurface and hoping that they, the hydrogen will gone, undergo bacterial conversion to produce this biomethane. So these are the underground sun storage project by RAG in Australia and the High Chico project in, in Argentina. Um, and of course, you know, although they're trying to produce biomethane, they are gaining, you know, really good experience in storing hydrogen in the porous rocks. Uh, and while doing, you know, gaining that valuable operating experience in hydrogen injection and storage in the surface. So there's a lot to be learning from that. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, we have the hybrid project in Sweden. Uh, so they may struggle to find salt caverns and porous rocks. So, so they, 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 they need to look a little bit more creatively at what they're at their geological storage. So they are planning to develop a 100 cubic meter um, hydrogen storage capacity in an enclosed rock cavern. So that will be around about 30 meters below ground. Uh, so this is a really exciting opportunity because that, that um, hydrogen is going to be used for decarbonized steel production. Um, so that they're already getting underway with that. So that the storage is enabling them to upscale their operations. Um, so I think that that hybrid project is going to be really interesting um, about you know engineering a cavern um, uh, and see you know particularly for countries which don't have these suitable salt or porous rock deposits. So so you know all geological space I think is is open for um, for investigation uh, and and I think that's really exciting. So the, you know. We've got experience of natural gas storage. We're gaining experience in, in hydrogen storage. I think that the outlook is really positive for hydrogen storage in terms of ambition. Um, so this slide here kind of looks at, well, if we were to, for example, use our natural gas fields, um, you know, how much hydrogen can they store? This was one of the first questions we, we wanted to ask at Edinburgh and really kind of understand that storage capacity for hydrogen uh, over, over our oil and gas fields. So. Uh, because we, you know, utilising that existing oil and gas expertise, infrastructure, favourable geology um, is really an important consideration in the energy trend. And those supply chains and infrastructure are not left behind at all in that transition to a low carbon future. So we really wanted to understand how many depleted gas fields we might need to repurpose for hydrogen storage um, and, and focus really on replacing natural gas for hydrogen for heat. Um, so the figure that you can see there on the screen, the UK map is shaded by its energy storage demand. So this was not about supplying the base load, this was about storage. Um, so the map is shaded by energy storage demand for heating um, for each of our gas supply regions with darker colours reflecting greater energy storage demand. 
the blue lines on the map are the gas pipelines that are linked to gas terminals, um, which are shown as small triangles. So the green and the yellow circles are our calculated and scaled energy capacities um, for a range of offshore gas fields and um, presented in terawatt hours, with a larger circle reflecting a larger storage capacity of the field. So these are pinpointed to specific uh, depleted gas fields. Um, and as you can see, our results indicate that there are thousands of terawatt hours of hydrogen storage capacity in the North Sea depleted gas fields, far more than the, the 100 terawatt hours that actually were anticipated to need for our own use. Uh, so, so we have this significant storage capacity for, for export or, or other um, applications that we might consider to, do, to, to, to explore. So, so this was the kind of first indication that actually, you know, these, these um, you know, the, the, this, there's certainly something to be had there about these using, reusing our oil and gas fields because they can certainly hold more than enough um, hydrogen in, in, the, in those pore spaces than we need. Um, so, you know, it was really good. We, we kind of identified this opportunity and offered by the hydrogen storage and porous media, but, but we need to now really establish whether it's completely feasible to store hydrogen porous, um, hydrogen in these porous rocks. Um, and that's really what the high store pore and indeed the high use pre project is, is wanting to, is, is, is trying to do and really establish these fundamental understandings um, uh, and, and really understand what exactly is going to happen when the hydrogen is stored in these reservoirs. So the High Store Core Project has a number of aims um, where we're, we're working to identify if there's any biological and geochemical reactions between the rock, the existing reservoir fluids and the injected hydrogen that could compromise storage. So this can be through geochemical or microbial reactions that may dissolve or block the rock or consume or contaminate the hydrogen. So we, we've got to look at the full system of, of, of what might happen, that injectivity and that contamination um, of the hydrogen. So we also want to determine what flow processes are going to influence that hydrogen migration and trapping during injection and withdrawal into geological stores, essentially ensuring that we can get the hydrogen that we inject into the reservoir back out again over these multiple annual cycles of injection and withdrawal um, over the life cycle of a reservoir um, or storage site. Um, we're also undertaking reservoir simulations to investigate how to kind of optimise these storage sites to provide the required injection and withdrawal rates and, and manage that reservoir in the subsurface, whether that's trying to minimise any mixing between the, say, for example, the methane that's already there, which may act as a cushion gas uh, and contaminate the hydrogen working gas, or understand how we can deliver those required withdrawal rates into the energy system at the pressures that they need. So the reservoir simulation work is really important to establish a lot of this work. Um, and then last but certainly not least uh, is our work in understanding what citizens and opinion shapers think about hydrogen storage and its role in you know, and the contribution that it can make in, in achieving net zero. So, so these were the kind of key um, aims of the of the high high store core project. Um, so yeah, we're in the second year of the high store core project, um, which hasn't been helped by the labs being closed, but we've really made some some really excellent progress actually. So I'll just go through a few of these, um, and certainly you know the message so far is very encouraging. Um, there's been no show, showstoppers and uh, actually quite a lot of our findings are, are really quite encouraging. We're positive about hydrogen storage. Um, so um, a, a significant concern is always whether microbes will um, consume or contaminate the hydrogen. Uh, and indeed the RAG Sun Storage Project and the High Chico Project are, 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 are kind of utilising that exact uh, reaction to generate methane. So of course it is a significant concern is, is whether the, the, those subsurface microbes will consume the hydrogen. Um, so what we wanted to do was we looked at the life limits of the three key hydrogen consuming bacteria with regards to temperature and salinity and pressure because these are, these are things that really, they, you know, that, that are encountered in these subsurface storage sites and indeed vary between so storage sites. So um, so our fine bar with temperatures over 122 degrees or with solar <laughs> fields that have both temperatures above 55 degrees and salinities over two um, molar NAC, um, NACL equivalent will actually be quite unfavorable to microbial growth and may some of those may even be considered quite sterile to them. Um, so this gives us kind of almost like a biological site screening as it were. Um, and looking at the North Sea gas fields, a number of them, uh, you know, many, many of them have conditions unfavourable to microbial growth. So we can almost kind of reduce the risk of microbial action 
which is a which is inevitable if it's in the subsurface but we can kind of holistically reduce that risk by by through clever slight selection um, and of course our capacity estimates have, have indicated that we don't need a lot of fields you know we don't need millions of or hundreds of fields to supply our energy storage demand for hydrogen we only need a few so we can be really strategic and careful about how we select our sites um, and, and rather than having to kind of biocide the whole uh, subsurface, we can select slight sites that have these salinity and um, temperature conditions that, 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 that re reduce the risk of microbial action. So that's very good news for hydrogen storage, I would say. And, and we really, you know, and that work has been published um, and, uh, and, and you can read that. Uh, so the link is on the bottom of the slide and I'm happy to share uh, all of that information um, with you. We, we've got quite a lot of published work from um, publications from the work we've done in the high store for. So we're trying to get our data out as quickly as we can. Um, another concern, of course, is that hydrogen injection may induce mineral reactions, uh, damaging the reservoir over time. So we have undertaken over 200 geochemistry experiments with hydrogen at reservoir conditions of pressure and temperature on a huge range of reservoir rocks, um, reservoir cap rocks, well cements, uh, and, and casing, and, uh, and, and indeed pure mineral phases, actually. Uh, you know, we have really done our best to try and make sure that if something's going to happen, we would see it. So we've powdered, we've, you know, we really have done whatever we can to try and, in, you know, if there's going to be a reaction to happen, we're going to pick it up. Uh, and so far, we haven't seen any significant geochemical reactions um, in our in our experiments, which some of which have gone over quite a long period of time. And um, still a wide range of rocks to test. We still need to do field testing, of course. Uh, all of this is still in the laboratory, um, so we need to to move out of the lab and into into pilot sites. But um, you know, but the work with RAG and and um, and High Chico injecting hydrogen into the subsurface, you know, they will be seeing that. You know, they will be determining whether any of these geochemical reactions are, are happening as well. So, so you know, between between the pilot sites and the experiments, we can we can get a pretty good handle on what's happening. Um, so yeah, and then of course our storage capacity estimates work has established there's significant storage capacity in these depleted fields, uh, far in excess of what we might need for our seasonal energy storage. And I, I think this kind of highlights an important aspect of the subsurface, and that's the kind of competition for core space really that's going to be required for other geo energy applications, particularly carbon capture and storage or compressed air energy storage. Um, so I think it highlights that there's there's plenty of room in the subsurface for all of these low carbon energies. Different sites are going to have different um, suitabilities, I would say, for, for what geoenergy application they can use. So if we take, for example, salinity, um, you know, for, for hydrogen storage, it's going to be quite favourable to their um, storage because the um, you know, that inhibits that microbial growth. Um, whereas for a CO2 storage site, actually, we don't really want a high, that, a high salinity because that reduces the, the um, dissolution of CO2 into the pore fluids. So we may find that there's this natural sorting between between the storage sites, which which I think is going to be a really interesting area. Um, and, and, and so that will shake out as, as time goes on. And, uh, and I think it will be really interesting to see how that develops. Um, so we have been doing a lot more. Uh, I could talk for hours on the progress of, of, of the High Store 4 project. We've been imaging our uh, imaging hydrogen flow through um, using X-ray CT to see where that hydrogen occupies the pore space. And we just uh, we just had a wonderful session down in Diamond uh, to do some time resolved imaging of hydrogen um, through the pore space. And again, the, the, the images that we were able to see during the experiment certainly indicate that hydrogen is behaving almost as you would expect it to do, you know, taking, you know, occupying that central pore space. Um, but uh, yeah, we have something like 55 terabytes of data. So one of my colleagues, I can face is working on that. So uh, that might take a wee while for us to get that, that information out to the, to the community. But, uh, but I know I can work as quickly as she can to, to get that data out there and, and share that with the, with the wider community. Occupies a pore space, how it changes wettability um, or influences wettability, those contact angles that, you know, the residual water saturations, all of these information that we're, we really should be able to, to release at some point when we're, as soon as we get that data um, analysed and looked through. So this is going to be really important. Um, and then, yeah, so 
just to kind of move on a bit from the high store core project because I, of course the, the discussion is wider than that um, and really understand that sort of developing this hydrogen economy requires well it's really tackling a chicken and egg problem we need to we need to grow supply and demand really in tandem to bring down those costs in that fair and just manner um, and that's kind of emphasized in these um, hydrogen strategies and action plans um, and the 10-point plan for the green recovery and the North Sea transition deal. So we've really got to create that market, that supply and demand um, market to, to, to enable these costs, um, co you know, the scaling of costs. Um, and to do that, hydrogen storage plays one part of that, but it is just an it's simply one aspect within a very complex energy system. Um, so we need this collaborative interdisciplinary research to really fully integrate each and every aspect of that whole energy system. So it, that kind of, if you take it from the hydrogen enablers, um, you know, so the production, so the green and the blue hydrogen production, I, I, I didn't touch on that, but that's always an interesting discussion about the, the benefits of, of the green hydrogen from, from renewables and the blue hydrogen from um, steam reformation of, of um, hydrocarbons and CCS. Um, so we need to, to enable the hydrogen from the production side and bring those costs down uh, and scales up. We need also these multiple scales of hydrogen storage. Um, so, of course, I talked, focused on the porous rock findings from the high store core project, but, you know, we, we need to we need to consider the hydrogen storage at all aspects. So those physical based stores of gas and liquid hydrogen um, from tanks to the geology to material based hydrogen storage as well. So that's the hydrogen hydrides, the liquid organic hydrogen and the chemical hydrogen such as ammonia. So hydrogen can be stored in these many different ways and, and all of these will play their part. Um, so it's not just hydrogen gas uh, that, that we're looking at. Um, we also need to include understanding how the hydrogen fits within the pipeline and the shipping distribution um, of hydrogen to get that out and into the system. Uh, and then, of course, the whole system energy integration of, of hydrogen and electricity into that resilient future energy network. So it's a really complex system that everything needs to kind of talk to each other and, and, and do that. Um, and not forgetting, of course, that we need to we need to understand that end user. Um, so that marketplace, that transport, heat power and industry and, and really create those opportunities to, to supply the hydrogen to these users. Um, and, and uh, you know, in collaboration across the, well, really the global community, I would say, um, you know, to, to understand that this is kind of ensuring a fair and just energy transition, bring down those costs, um, up, you know, uptake those technologies and, and really work together to, to support that um, global energy transition in a fair, uh, in a fair manner. And then finally, a few words on barriers. Um, I don't want to be too negative on this because it's in early stages and there's lots to do. Um, uh, you know, we, we, there's certainly um, encouraging words of support, uh, whether or not money is, is there and, and, the, and the sort of incentives are there to back it up. Um, but certainly the, there's words of support from the UK and the to meet net zero. You know, this is this is kind of non-negotiable. Um, so, so things are going to have to happen. Um, and, and I think really, you know, there's a number of barriers which are highlighted on the slide, but really we need initiatives to support the renewable and low carbon energy use. Um, so that directly supports the scale up of development of infrastructure assets and technology, because if there's a, is it, if there's a market there, then you know, there's an incentive to produce the hydrogen and, and that leads to hydrogen production cost reductions, shortened path to commercialization, and um, and we can do that through target funding and grants. Le compteur est arrivé à zéro, mais le vote est toujours ouvert, en fait. Donc, OK, and uh, we also need initiatives counteracting the carbon in intensive energy use. Uh, and really make these carbon intensive solutions less attractive. But I always think at the same time, we really have to do this in a fair and just way. Um, so, you know, we really need incentives to support the facilitating of repurposing and reskilling in green energy technologies and, and not just uh, focus on making things so expensive, but not having an alternative there because that just simply doesn't work. Um, and then, of course, that supportive regulatory framework within the, across the entire hydrogen system. So that's going to be from safety protocols, gas purity levels in our gas network, gas storage permits for subsurface storage, um, and really that economy of matching supply and demand uncertainty so that, that, that investment can, can have confidence in the market. Um, so those are just to name uh, just a few. 
Um, and then, of course, finally, we really need to develop that community uptake of hydrogen as a green solution for energy delivery. And, and I, I really do think that these kind of community projects with the buses or the, sh the shipping up in Orkney or, you know, the aviation and, and, and where communities are, are invested in this um, in this hydrogen as a new, um, as a kind of, you know, an, another alt an, another pathway for green energy is, is really exciting. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's, I would say that, that it's, uh, it's, it's not a solution to everything, but it will help so, um, in solving some of the, the, the those more challenging issues in decarbonisation as we move to net zero. So thanks, Amanda, that's me. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Juna. So um, perhaps a couple of questions come through. So we've only got a couple of minutes for these. But uh, first one that's come up on my screen is, uh, is there an optimum pore size to store hydrogen in pore rock? Ah, that's a really nice question. So we will have the answer for that <laughs> when we have our, our, um, our, our X-ray CT imaging analysis done. So at the moment, that would be really hard to say. Um, I have done some kind of diffusion experiments through um, quite a wide open pore network and hydrogen is really interesting because it travels, it almost sees all the pore space, but because of that it sort of travels together so it has this kind of slower travel time, but it, it almost sees everything so nothing hinders it. Uh, but that, that um, you know, we haven't really looked at that in different um, pore networks, so I think that's work to come. That's certainly second year, uh, or that's the, the work we're going to be focusing on, the flow processes uh, in the next year. So maybe in a year's time, I'll have an update on that. So, yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Oh, Amanda, sorry, I think you're muted. <laughs> I was going to do that at one point, wasn't I? Um, so another, another question we have is, given much lower density of hydrogen versus natural gas, any geomechanical concerns such as formation, compaction, collapse, seismic risk? Absolutely. So, you know, again, these are, you know, managing the pressure of the reservoir is going to be key and that is going to be more challenging with, with hydrogen. And I think that's where the, the cushion gases come in. Very, You know, they'll play a very important role in, in managing that you know, that whole system pressure so that we're not, you know, we're not dropping things lower than we should do. Uh, so I, I suspect we'll be able to, hopefully we'll be able to manage it from an operational point of view. And that's where the reservoir simulation work comes in to, to really look at that. Uh, and then of course, understanding that cap rock integrity, initiation of fractures, uh, and you're right about seismic. Uh, so I think not just seismic in terms of monitoring that whole system mechanics, but also, understanding that plume and, and where it is. So, so we have got some work going on at, at Edinburgh to try and understand how we might be able to see that, you know, that, that difference between the hydrogen, work, uh, the hydrogen working gas and say the cushion gas that's also providing that structure, pressure structure uh, support to the, whole, to the whole storage system. So yeah, um, I think this, yeah, it's really important. Um, and we'll be modeling that uh, and there's a, one of my colleagues, Nicholas, is talking this afternoon. Um, so he may have some more about that because he has been modelling these issues uh, in his reservoir simulations. So, yeah, watch this afternoon session too. <laughs> yes, we'll advertise that at the end of this panel. Um, so one last question before we move on to our la uh, next speaker is um, from the experiments you have done in the High Store Pool project. What seems to be the most important characteristic of the reservoir that we need to understand for H2 storage um, in depleted gas reservoirs? So, yeah, that's a really nice question. And, and we haven't sorted out the, the relative importance of, of things, but I definitely think that the bacterial is, is really going to be a, an important one. So for that, we're really looking at temperature and salinity um, and, and, and one, or, one or the other of those, I would say, because that's something we really do want to minimise. Um, because hydrogen has got quite a low solubility, that it, you know all of these other aspects don't really matter so much. It will be interesting to see what impact the salinity has on um, um, things like capillary entry pressures and things like that. So it may be that actually in the end temperature is a good one. Um, but I think we'll, we'll, that will, I think, shake itself out uh, in time. And sorry, we can't answer that one quite yet, uh, but, uh, but we're certainly working to get there. Uh, thank you everyone for all the questions. There's loads coming through, but unfortunately we haven't got the time for, for all of them, but um, there may be some space for some open discussion later. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Kat Jonas. So I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, which is Richard Stevenson um, from Innovin. So Richard, can you share your screen?
Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, right. we'll... um, yeah, I mean, excellent previous presentation. Uh, I'm not sure I've actually got anything left to say because you covered uh, virtually everything in um, terms of high net, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, storage, salt caverns. Um, so uh, you've pretty covered, uh, pretty much covered uh, everything I could say, uh, but I'll, I'll have a go. Um, sure. Can you see my screen now? Yep, all good. Thanks, Richard. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm not a geologist. Uh, I'm actually a chemist, but uh, I haven't done chemistry for a, a long time. Uh, but I work for Ineos. Uh, I work for the Innovant Business within Ineos. Um, and, and building on what Catriona has just said, um, yeah, we believe hydrogen is, is the fuel of the future. Uh, it's pretty much the um, Heineken of fuels uh, in terms of it, it reaches everything. And, and Catriona said this, you know, as well as replacing natural gas, it can replace fuel in vehicles. Uh, it can replace, you know, coke in steel production. Um, it can and pretty much do anything uh, that you want and you can store it uh, more easily than, than you can uh, store electricity. Uh, so that's really what I was going to focus on today. Um, but for those who don't know, a, a very quick introduction to INEOS. Uh, we're a sports company, uh, INEOS Cycling, uh, America's Cup Sailing, uh, Formula One, uh, and we make some other stuff as well. We make a few chemicals. Um, so we're quite, quite big across the world. Uh, we employ a lot of people uh, in the UK, uh, and I'm going to talk today about hydrogen storage in salt caverns in the UK. So it's a UK focused. Uh, within the UK, Innovan um, is, is quite big. Uh, we have a number of sites. Uh, we make PVC, which is used in double glazing, uh, which keeps your houses warm. We make uh, is using cables. Uh, for uh, electricity and it's used to make blood bags and medical products and a whole bunch of things. So we make important stuff. Um, we also make chlorine, which is used for water treatment uh, and the entire UK's water treatment system pretty much is purified with our chlorine. Um, moving on, uh, why hydrogen and why us? Uh, well, hydrogen clearly um, because it, uh, it is the Heineken of fuels, it can be used anywhere. Why us? Well, uh, hydrogen isn't new, um, and, and Katrina, Katriona said this. Um, it's been around for quite a long time. At our Runcorn site in uh, in Cheshire, we have been making hydrogen for over 100 years. Um, so it isn't new to us. Uh, we make hydrogen. We use hydrogen uh, as a fuel for our boilers to make steam. Uh, we supply hydrogen to other customers. Uh, who use it to make other products uh, such as hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we, we burn hydrogen and chlorine to make HCL. Uh, so it's got quite a lot of uses uh, and it's been around quite a long time. Um, Innovan, uh, part of the Ineos business, uh, Ineos company, uh, is the largest electrolysis operator in Europe uh, at the moment. Um, so we co-produce hydrogen with chlorine and sodium hydroxide. Uh, so we think we're well placed in the green hydrogen arena. Uh, because we're key in electrolysis. Um, and so as well as electrolysis of brine, which is what we do now, we could do electrolysis of uh, water to make hydrogen. Uh, but we are agnostic about colour uh, and, and have nothing against uh, blue hydrogen and the, the high net project which we're involved in is a blue hydrogen project. Um, so in terms of the geology and what we do, um, and, and to show it's not new, um, we have been solution mining the Holford Brownfield, which is in mid Cheshire, uh, between Northwich, Natsford and Middlewich. Uh, we've been solution mining in a controlled manner since the 1920s. Uh, we have about 2000 hectares of land, 4000 acres of land. Uh, we have over 200 caverns that we've solution mined over that period. Uh, and that's all about brine production to feed the chemical industry of Cheshire. We supply brine for chloralkali to make chlorine, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen. We supply brine for sodium carbonate, soda ash production. Uh, and we also make white salt, uh, table salt for food uh, production. Uh, so we make, we produce quite a lot of brine. Uh, we used to produce quite a lot more than that, but uh, the demands are somewhat lower today. Um, and, and it's quite a lot of salt. Um, 
The northern part of the brine field, uh, which is the top half of this screen, uh, is where the 200 normal brine winning caverns are. Uh, and the southern part of the brine field uh, is where we've moved on to gas storage. Um, and, and what is our gas storage operations? Um, the, the early gas storage on the site uh, dates back to the 1980s. We have two ethylene gas storage caverns. Uh, they're now out of service, uh, but since 1985, they were storing uh, ethylene gas. And, and ethylene is actually more challenging uh, to store, to process than hydrogen. Um, not only is it flammable, uh, it will auto detonate, whereas hydrogen obviously needs an ignition source and needs oxygen. Uh, uh, ethylene, if you don't treat it carefully, uh, will auto detonate. Um, so it, it's quite tricky to store, but we've been storing in, in two caverns um, for, for decades. Uh, as I say, they're now at a service, but um, for decades we were storing ethylene, 100,000 meter cube caverns. Uh, 25 to 50 bar. Uh, and we also have one natural gas storage cabin that dates back to the same period um, that was used for, for daily balancing of the local grid. Uh, then in around about 2000, we started looking at larger scale gas storage. Um, and uh, we have two projects, one operated by Uniper, uh, known as Holford Gas Storage. It consists of eight caverns. It's at the bottom of the screen um, and is 160 million cubic meters of natural gas. Uh, and we have a large project, which is 20 caverns operated by Stub uh, Store Energy, uh, known as Stubblatch Gas Storage. Uh, and that's 400 million cubic meters of gas. The, the two projects are two of the largest natural gas stores uh, in the UK. Um, and to inject uh, a little bit of economics into the last presentation, um, you know, the UK has got huge resources in terms of both salt cavern storage, depleted reservoir storage, aquifer storage, uh, but they all come at a price. Um, and you have to consider that price when you're developing these things and who's going to pay. Um, and if you look at the natural gas world, uh, and, and I think hydrogen is probably going to mirror the natural gas world, um, then we only have uh, a limited number of depleted reservoir stores in the UK now. Uh, we mostly use salt caverns for storage of natural gas. Uh, the one large, very large uh, natural gas store depleted reservoir in the North Sea closed down a few years ago. It was known as Rough. Uh, it was 400 or 4,000 million cubic meters of gas. It was huge, uh, but it was too expensive to operate. Um, and, and being an old gas field, it required quite a lot of maintenance. Anything offshore costs a lot more, 10 times as much as offshore. You can drill a borehole onshore, you can drill a borehole offshore. It's about 10 times the price to do it offshore. Um, and so, you know, everything becomes more expensive. Um, so salt caverns are likely to be the, you know, the, the first, leading the pack, shall we say, the first um, future stores for hydrogen. Uh, compared to depleted reservoirs or to compared to offshore stuff. Uh, in time, I'm sure they'll come and, and when we need more storage. And, and clearly, the UK needs storage. Um, the lack of storage is demonstrated by the sky high gas prices we have at the moment. So gas prices are high across the world, across Europe, uh, but the UK is suffering particularly. Um, and we have much higher energy costs than a lot of the rest of Europe. Why we have less storage uh, than the rest of Europe. Um, so uh, that's the existing gas storage projects. We had uh, planning consent uh, for a third large scale natural gas storage project. Uh, we started work in 2014, 2015 on a project known as Kuiper Gas Storage. It was, it was 19 caverns. It would have been 450 MCM of natural gas. It was fully consented in 2017, uh, but not developed because uh, there's, there's no money in natural gas storage today. Um, so we couldn't make a business case to develop the project despite having the capability of creating the caverns uh, and uh, the planning consent in place. Um, as, as Catriona said, 
hydrogen storage in salt is not new um, and I can't tell you much about these projects. I don't, uh, I don't know a lot of detail, but hydrogen in salt caverns is proven, uh, particularly in the UK. We have Teesside, they are small caverns compared to what we do in Cheshire. Uh, but in Teesside, they have uh, a hydrogen storage cavern. They, have, they had natural gas storage caverns and they also store a number of other uh, chemical intermediates. Uh, so, but particularly hydrogen has been around for a long time. It's also stored in Texas. Um, and, and so it's proven uh, that salt is okay for hydrogen storage. It's just about the right technologies and we'll come on to those in a minute. Uh, what have we done on the whole for Brian Field and, and in the Cheshire area? Uh, we were part of a project called Centurion. It was looking at new build 100 megawatt cell room for green hydrogen production but part of the project included looking at existing gas storage and how we would convert those to uh, hydrogen storage. You know, you know, what needed to be done in terms of materials and construction uh, and how would they operate? And we looked at a range of caverns uh, from a, the ethylene storage caverns that I mentioned earlier, 100,000 meter cubed. We looked at natural gas storage cavern at 175,000 meter cubed, and we looked at a natural gas storage cavern at 300,000 meter cubed. Uh, Store Energy did a lot of the engineering work for that. Uh, we haven't taken any further um, at the moment, uh, but that was a good project a couple of years ago. Uh, we also had some funding from Bayes uh, to look at a new build cavern, a single cavern. Um, which we can solution mine. We, we're solution mining salt caverns all the time. Um, it would have been 350,000 meter cubed and it would have stored uh, about uh, 1,800 tonnes of hydrogen. Uh, we had money from Bayes to look at the feasibility of that and the engineering, uh, but we failed to secure sufficient money to actually go ahead and develop the cavern. Uh, we're also working in France at Etres, um, with Store Energy and a number of European companies on a project known as Hipster. That's looking at an existing cavern at the Etres site uh, and it's trialing um, different operating scenarios. So injecting hydrogen into a cavern um, and, and determining how the cavern performs as you cycle the cavern through its pressures. Um, that's a, a European funded project uh, and is ongoing at the moment. Uh, and then along comes HiNet. Um, so HiNet, uh, as, as Catriona said, is the Northwest's uh, answer to the net zero and decarbonizing agenda. Uh, HiNet consists of um, eight main consortium partners. Uh, and at the bottom there is a list of, of what we're all doing, but ENI, ENI is responsible for the carbon capture and storage in, in the RSC, in the depleted gas reservoir, the Hamilton Field, which is coming to the end of its life. Uh, and so part of that decommissioning will be convert, converted to a carbon store. Uh, there are a number of carbon emitters in, in the consortium, CF Fertilizers, Hanson Cement, SR Refinery, all in, uh, emit carbon dioxide now. Uh, so they would capture that carbon and, and provide it over the fence to ENI, who would uh, safely store it away. Um, the main focus of HiNet, though, is hydrogen production, blue hydrogen uh, from autothermal reform in the natural gas. Um, and that will be done by SR and Progressive Energy at the Stanley refinery. The carbon dioxide will be captured uh, as above. Uh, and the hydrogen would be distributed by Cadent. Cadent is the local gas operator in the Northwest region. Uh, initially, we're talking about new build hydrogen pipelines because the natural gas pipelines are all in use. Uh, so there would be a network of um, hydrogen, uh, new build hydrogen pipelines that would feed initially industry in time. It could go to residential, it could go to transport. Um, and it can sort of be blended into or replace the, the existing network uh, across the region. But initially, it's, it's the quick win, low hanging fruit in terms of uh, big users, big emissions, uh, but fewer connections rather than trying to try tackle residential, which is a little bit harder. Um, and so it's the glass makers, the ceramics, the industries that currently need direct fire heat. They can't easily, so glass manufacturing can't easily electrify everything. 
because they want direct fire heat. Hydrogen is a good replacement for natural gas there. Um, so there are a number, not in the consortium, but there are a number of hydrogen, um, potential hydrogen consumers in all of that, that Caden will supply hydrogen. To balance supply and demand, you need storage. Um, uh, and clearly that's true of natural gas, it's true of uh, electricity, uh, and, it, and it's true of hydrogen. Uh, so that's where Innovin come in, we can provide that storage. Uh, and the last partner in the consortium is the University of Chester, who are looking at the skills and jobs um, and, and the softer elements of, of the project. So Hynet needs 1.3 terawatt hours of storage, uh, and as luck would have it, the Kuiper gas storage project that was consented in 2017 uh, happens to be about the right size uh, to meet that storage demand. So 19 caverns would have been 450 MCM of natural gas. It can now be 1.3 terawatt hours, and they're different units, I know, um, of hydrogen storage. The one question I would have in the last um, presentation was the scale of uh, salt carbon storage versus depleted reservoirs. I would like to see that range expanded a little bit. Uh, a single salt cavern can, in Cheshire uh, can store uh, about 50 gigawatt hours of energy as hydrogen, uh, and 19 caverns can store about 1.3 terawatt hours uh, of energy as hydrogen. So uh, they've got quite a, a wide range. So what are we doing um, in terms of the project? Uh, as I said, it was fully consented for natural gas. We need to change that consent uh, for, um, to allow the storage of hydrogen. Um, so we have done a number of packages of work uh, before we approach the planning inspectorate uh, to make that change in planning. We want to satisfy ourselves that we can do this safely and that it all works and it all fits in the same box. Um, so we've done a lot of work on subsurface engineering. Uh, we employ a company called Geostock, uh, based in Paris, um, who have in the past done all of the design for our natural gas storage caverns. Um, and we asked, we asked them to take the natural gas reports that they produce to support the planning uh, consent that we have uh, and modify them for hydrogen. So they've looked at capacities, maximum pressures, minimum pressures, rock mechanics, thermodynamics, uh, to determine how much hydrogen we can store. Uh, and the answer is 1.3 terawatt hours. Uh, that came from Geostock. Uh, but it looks at uh, the um, you know, maximum minimum pressures, but also the injectability and deliverability of those caverns, uh, because the HINET uh, project needs a certain amount of hydrogen storage. Uh, it needs it to be delivered in a certain way. Um, and there are differences between natural gas and hydrogen. So the maximum minimum pressures are pretty much the same. That's to do with the uh, lithostatic pressures of the caverns. But how quickly you can put hydrogen in or take hydrogen out of store obviously depends on the thermodynamics. And I'm sure people know hydrogen um, doesn't have the same Joules-Thompson effect. Um, so it doesn't behave in quite the same way when you inject and withdraw from caverns. So all of those things have to be studied and have been completed by Geostock. Um, they've looked at the materials of construction for the casings, the wellheads, the seals, um, and all the components. And, and generally, it's not radically different um, from natural gas. So there's certain things you have to do differently. Um, certain grades of steel you can use and other grades you can't use. So in natural gas, we would tolerate a wider range of steels in the casings. Um, Whereas for hydrogen, we're limited to J55, K55, uh, slightly more expensive um, than L80, but, you know, they're still common, commonly used in the natural gas industry. Um, so the steel casings are all available. Subtle differences like uh, for natural gas, you weld the casings for the gas completion, whereas for hydrogen, we would use premium screw thread uh, and not weld because welding, um, hydrogen will attack the welds. Uh, and that's the problem because the weld isn't quite the same steel as the rest of the tube. Um, so we're looking at threaded casings rather than welded casings. Uh, wellheads, pretty much the same, but again, it's the choice of the steel. Uh, the harder one is the seals. You can get elastomer seals that are good for hydrogen, uh, for other things, because we've been making hydrogen and compressing hydrogen and using hydrogen for a long time, but not in wellheads. 
Um, so there's some development work required by the warhead manufacturers to produce uh, the right seals, elastomers that can be used with hydrogen because natural gas ones won't work. Um, just touching on another overlap with um, the previous speaker around um, impurities and, and chemical reactions in the caverns. Uh, and this is the, the one outstanding question we have um, is H2S formation. We know we have sulfur, sulfate reducing bacteria. And despite our caverns having saturated brine in the bottom of them, we know that sulfate reducing bacteria exist um, in, in brine, in water, during solution mining. Uh, and in natural gas, that does not lead to H2S formation. It's not a problem. But in hydrogen, um, the simple chemistry tells you that it will lead to H2S formation. Um, what we don't know is the rate and therefore whether it's a problem. H2S is a, not only a corrosion problem for the steels, but also it will be removed by the gas processing plant. Um, but the normal vent from a gas processing plant um, would just go to atmosphere. And clearly you can't uh, emit H2S into atmosphere because it's uh, unpleasant uh, smell and it's also toxic and, and prohibited. So we would have to treat for H2S. Um, <clears throat> Whether it's a real problem, um, all, all depends on the reaction kinetics and dynamics in the cavern and, and whether, the, you know, how long the hydrogen's in there for, um, you know, static and how quickly it dissolves into the brine and reacts um, and releases H2S or will all the H2S stay in the brine if the brine is alkaline? Um, so all those questions still to be answered. Uh, we've done the topside safety case, so um, we've been looking at hazard substances, concern and coma. We haven't submitted those yet, uh, but we've been working through those. Um, you'll be pleased to know that hydrogen is no, no worse than natural gas from um, a leak at the wellhead point of view. Obviously, we don't want leaks, uh, but if there was, you have to consider all eventualities in these, um, in these requirements. Uh, if there was a leak at the wellhead, then actually the radiant heat from hydrogen um, and the amount of hydrogen that would be released is no worse than if it was a natural gas leak. Uh, you, if you're a certain distance away, you stand back and watch it. Um, so we're pretty confident that we can get through the safety case okay. Um, and we are look, currently looking at the uh, hydrogen gas processing plant. Uh, we have to inject hydrogen into the caverns. Um, and we have to uh, process the hydrogen coming out of the caverns to dry it. Um, so unlike natural gas, and because of the, 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 the likely network pressure for hydrogen, we're probably only compressing in uh, and free flowing out, which means we can deliver very high rates of hydrogen, uh, but we can only fill more slowly. Um, it's a lot harder to compress hydrogen uh, than it is to compress natural gas. So we need um, recip compressors, which are big, ugly, noisy machines, rather than some centrif machines, which you use with natural gas. Um, so the processing is different, um, but it's possible. It's done now. Um, it's just the scale of the operation that uh, would be unique for this project. Uh, I won't dwell on this because you're all geologists and I'm sure you know, um, but for those who don't know, um, how do you create a cavern? You drill a borehole to the bottom of the salt, uh, you cement in steel casings to the top of the salt uh, and to the top of where you want the cavern to be, pump water down, dissolve the salt, uh, forces the brine to surface. We want the brine, we use the brine in the chemical industry um, and over a period of time you create a cavern you can control the solution mining zone with the depth setting depth of the tubes uh, with the use of an inert blanket nitrogen uh, that stops solution mining upwards but allows you to solution mine outwards uh, and by varying the pressure of the blanket the flow rate of the brine the setting depth of the tubes you can control the shape of that cavern very precisely and you can measure uh, the shape of that cavern uh, with sonar survey tools. Uh, and I've just read uh, that SOCOM, uh, European company, um, have developed now and can, uh, since September this year, uh, they have uh, done a sonar survey of the first hydrogen cavern uh, to prove that they, their tools and equipment will work in hydrogen. 
Um, so yeah, normally we do, when we're developing the caverns, you're doing sonar surveys in uh, brine, which is fine and that's quite common. Uh, but uh, once you're storing gas, you want to be able to check that the cavern shape hasn't changed. Uh, and to do a sonar survey under gas is, is for natural gas is, is common. Um, hydrogen, it's never been done before until now, but it has now been done, so that's good. Um, I won't, I can share these, I won't talk about these. This is for the geologists <laughs> in terms of our depth of salt, uh, our thickness of salt, where the caverns are. Um, and essentially for hydrogen, it doesn't make any difference. So the cavern's in the same place, it's the same size cavern. Um, that's the profile of our salt. Um, and um, you know, that's what our caverns will look like. So INEOS has announced uh, that it is investing two billion pounds, two billion euros uh, over the next 10 years across Europe in, in hydrogen projects and hydrogen production. Uh, it's already announced uh, electrolysis projects in Norway, Germany and Belgium. It's only a matter of time before we come to the UK and develop green hydrogen production. Uh, and we're going to continue working with the HiNet project to deliver hydrogen storage um, to the northwest. Um, we have started looking at also the conversion of our existing natural gas storage projects. And those are actually harder than new build because where you've got the wrong materials of construction, it's a lot harder to remove them uh, and replace them rather than start from scratch. Uh, that's all I was going to say. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, if you could all pop some questions into the question and answer um, uh, tab there, that would be really helpful. So um, I'm just going to pick some questions that are coming through. So we've just only got a few minutes for questions, but uh, one is any particular shallow hazard to consider before, drill it, before drilling and afterwards? Shallow hazard. Um, we, for, for our um, brine field, our area, we obviously have got hundreds of wells. Um, so we are very familiar with the, the geology. Um, we have 20, 30 meters of glacial drift and then mudstones for a couple hundred meters. Uh, we have had issues in the northern brine field with trapped air and we've drilled into pockets of trapped air uh, that have then come to surface. Um, but we believe that trapped air probably came from historic solution mining operations where we use compressed air as, as blanket, uh, where we've probably injected compressed air into the strata in the past, and then that's come out back at us decades later. Um, but no, no particular hazards in, in the, the deeper salt uh, where we are drilling um, for gas storage or hydrogen storage. Uh, we are very familiar with the geology there. Thank you. So I'm going to group a couple of questions together because they seem to be on the same theme. But uh, you're talking about uh, generation of the caverns and some people are interested at the rate or timing at which it takes to create those kind of caverns. Do you have anything um, on that at all? Uh, yeah. So it, I mean, normally for brine winning, if we're just solution mining a cavern for uh, for getting brine to supply the chemical industry, then then there's no urgency in creating the cavern. So uh, we want those caverns to be as big as possible within the strata that, that are supported. Um, and so we have a number of solution mining in parallel. We actually have 50 on the go at any one time, um, but we would need at least 20 being solution mined in parallel to provide the brine that we need for the chemical industry. For gas storage or hydrogen storage, then you want the cavern as quickly as possible. Um, so for those caverns, uh, we inject water at much higher rate. Um, they are smaller cabins. They're only 350,000 meter cubed. It's still twice the size of the Albert Hall, um, but they're they're smaller in compared to brine winning cabins. Uh, it takes about two and a half years to solution mine. Um, so you can't do it quicker than two and a half years to solution mine a gas storage cabin. Uh, and the rate, the number we can solution mine in parallel or the rate you can do them depends on our custom demand for brine unless we waste brine to the sea, uh, but we don't like to waste brine to the sea. Um, so um, we would typically develop five or six caverns in parallel over a two and a half year period. Uh, so the, the, the high net project is 19 caverns. That's probably eight to 10 years of solution mining. Uh, the first caverns will be ready after a few years. 
um, but then to get and and they del they will deliver quite a lot of the deliverability of hydrogen because you can inject hydrogen very quickly into caverns and, and withdraw it very quickly from caverns but to get the full capacity of the project would be say eight to ten years excellent thank you so uh, we're still getting loads of questions come in so if you pop them into the uh, q a box then we might be able to answer them later or while others are speaking but unfortunately we need to um uh, finish uh, Richard there. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us um, okay. because we need to um, move on to our next speaker. So I would like to introduce uh, Angus McCoss, uh, who will be giving our next presentation. And this presentation is going to be looking at, uh, so Angus is from DecarbonX and it'll be looking at large scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage to deliver the energy transition. So if you have questions for Angus, pop them into the Q&A um, during the, the talk and afterwards, and then we can answer them afterwards. Okay, so over to Flo. Yeah, maybe I'd just uh, say a few words before Flo launches the um, presentation. Um, thank you, Amanda. Um, and uh, thank you to Catriona and uh, Richard for these very informative uh, presentations uh, to set the scene. Good stuff. Um, I'm Angus McCoffs, PhD uh, in geology at Queen's University of Belfast. I have uh, 30 years of subsurface exploration and development uh, experience from technical to executive to non-executive. Um, I'm a non-executive uh, member of the Energy and Geoscience Institute at Utah, uh, the advisory board there. Um, I'm founder of uh, sustainableearthscientist.org, uh, which is a, a collaborative platform online for students to share uh, videos on on uh, climate change and the energy transition. So for uh, earth science students uh, watching today, I would encourage you to look at uh, sustainableearthscientist.org and to uh, get involved and uh, post your videos on this subject. Um, I'm founder and uh, CTO at uh, DecarbonX. Uh, we are a pioneering company um, delivering geoenergy uh, for the energy transition. Uh, so with that, um, I think we'd like to launch uh, the presentation. So thank you, Phil, please. Firstly, thank you to the University of Glasgow, the European Federation of Geologists and the Geological Society for the opportunity to speak at this COP26 event. We've been invited to discuss large scale subsurface storage of hydrogen which is a core business of DecarbonX. And given the monumental importance of COP26 in Glasgow, it's a privilege to participate. DecarbonX is a pioneering geoenergy company focused on large scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage to deliver the energy transition. We're also active in carbon sequestration, but today I'll concentrate on our hydrogen business. Let's first consider the headline question, hydrogen, red herring or silver bullet? Well, frankly, and with due respect, it's neither. Hydrogen is in fact a clean, versatile energy carrier, more like a high quality multi-tool for delivering the energy transition. And once green hydrogen is deployed at large scale with realistic economies of scale, incorporating industrial learning and operational efficiencies, Bloomberg project it will steadily outcompete fossil fuels in energy markets. And that's commercially why hydrogen is attracting trillions of dollars of investment to achieve global, de global decarbonization goals. Hydrogen is ideal for energy transfer, electricity generation, clean combustion, fertilizer production, molecular synthesis and transport fuels. Furthermore, hydrogen can be produced from multiple renewable energy sources and is perfect for large scale energy storage. DecarbonX is an asset focused geoenergy company. We're not consultants. We originate and develop projects to de deliver the energy transition, raising capital to invest with partners in offshore subsurface assets for hydrogen and hydrogen carrier storage and CO2 sequestration. We're smoothing the energy transition with our partners, 
for E&P companies will repurpose assets with industrial clusters we're solving their decarbonisation needs. And for energy system operators, we're balancing intermittency and solving grid curtailment. We're about developing reliable and resilient subsurface energy management systems to satisfy our partners' needs. From an investment perspective, we're building a rigorously screened, responsible and reliable future-proof portfolio of geoenergy assets. Whilst where we can best leverage our proprietary operational and regulatory experience in Ireland and Britain. We see a valuable interconnected regional energy market here. Europe is decarbonizing with a focus on its exceptional offshore wind energy resources. Ireland has the highest average wind speeds in the EU. Indeed, Ireland's tremendous wind energy resources vastly exceed its domestic needs. Norway was like this more than 50 years ago, a small ocean-facing nation with advanced capabilities. And in Ireland, it's wind energy, not natural gas. And in Ireland, it will be stored offshore subsurface as green hydrogen, not as water pumped up into Norwegian mountain lakes. Ireland can satisfy its energy needs and like Norway, generate sustainable regional economic prosperity while decarbonizing and export renewable energy via green hydrogen to the continent. Germany and the Netherlands, to name just two nations, are, are, are already expressing keen interest in Ireland's almost limitless green hydrogen energy resource potential. However, growth in renewables brings increased grid instability and for decarbonex, that brings baseload business opportunities to balance the grid. There's a compelling investment opportunity in, a developing, in, in developing reliable, large-scale, offshore, subsurface, green hydrogen energy storage capacity for Ireland and Britain. The investment case for Irish wind energy blows straight into your face. Ireland's wind resources are world-class. European net zero targets stimulate wind energy investments, removing grid curtailment losses, which can run to billions of euros per annum, must be cut. And once Ireland harnesses its wind at large scale, the green hydrogen export revenues will bring jobs and economic prosperity whilst making renewable energy affordable, enabling a fair and just transition. The Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland forecasts wind energy capacity growing to over 40 gigawatts by 2050 and attracting a cumulative investment of between 100 and 200 billion euros. Energy storage will only amount to a few percent of this investment, but without storage, this renewable energy ambition will stumble whenever the wind stalls. Large-scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage is key to delivery. Now, electrons make things work cleanly and hydrogen can generate them. In decarbonisation, we need electrons and molecules. Molecules matter, particularly at large scales and long distances. Natural gas is presently a major energy carrier at the large scale, whilst its carbon needs to be sequestered. Looking to the future, Bloomberg forecasts that by 2050, Clean hydrogen will make up as much as 25% of our net zero energy mix, generating a $20 trillion infrastructure investment opportunity, new technologies, jobs, and eventually lower cost energy. The global hydrogen economy is happening. But we must transition from natural gas towards future hydrogen carriers and hydrogen, the clean, versatile energy carrier. Decarbon is therefore managing its growth uh, project portfolio, evolving large-scale offshore subsurface energy storage solutions in the direction of the hydrogen economy. A key problem facing the accelerating and loosely integrated renewable energy sector is the naturally intermittent supply of wind and solar power. This is illustrated on the left. In red, during excessive wind, the grid can't cope 
leading to curtailment losses, whilst during deep troughs in the green, either the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. And these natural dips in renewable energy can impact entire regions, limiting the usefulness of electricity interconnectors between near neighbours. What we need is sketched on the right, a baseload balanced power profile that meets market demand. So how do we achieve that? Simply, DeCarbonX deploys power to hydrogen to power recycling using offshore subsurface storage. Excess power from wind turbines is converted to green hydrogen through electrolysis on windy days and stored underground until it's produced and piped to fuel cells, hydrogen turbines or directly to consumers. The whole process is clean, green and unseen. The heat from these processes can also be harnessed, enhancing system efficiency. Industrial uses of hydrogen also improve system economics and can help fuel decarbonisation. Technologically, we're in good shape on energy storage. We have many complementary solutions at various capacity scales across a range of discharge times. The chart on the left shows discharge time versus storage capacity. In the bottom left, flywheels and batteries are good for fast discharge and smaller capacities, good for light vehicles and managing short-term power fluctuations. Passing through compressed air storage and pumped water storage, we find hydrogen and natural gas in the top right. These are the mighty molecular means of energy storage best suited to delivering long discharge times from hours to years and with gigawatt to multi terawatt capacities, good for national, regional and continental scale energy systems. The schematic geological cross section illustrates three types of subsurface gas storage, depleted fields, salt caverns and saline aquifers. DeCarbonX is building a portfolio with all types of gas storage ultimately for hydrogen carriers and hydrogen. This will allow us to respond flexibly to market demand from seconds to seasons and to balance intermittency and solve grid curtailment. DeCarbonX sees great opportunities to leverage E&P experience, repurpose subsurface data and deploy proven methods to meet Ireland's short and long-term energy balancing needs. Integrating Ireland's large-scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage system is complex, and that's why we work in partnerships. I don't have time today to discuss each of these, but I shall talk about our ESB partnership. ESB is the leading integrated Irish utility and operates across the electricity market from generation through transmission and distribution to supply. It is also a strong leader in building the hydrogen economy for Ireland's multi-sector decarbonisation goals. In a significant strategic partnership, ESB and DeCarbonX agreed to jointly assess and develop large-scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage around Ireland. We work together on licensing, studies, site selection, sanctioning, offshore infrastructure, commissioning and operations offshore Dublin, Cork and Shannon, adjacent to ESB's strategic infrastructure. In this ESB energy system schematic, we see that energy storage in red is central and hydrogen is a vital energy car carrier. On the left, renewables at scale generate electricity and intermittent surpluses are converted to green hydrogen for utilization, storage and power regeneration, dispatching balanced energy to diverse customers on the right. Offshore subsurface hydrogen energy storage at scale is central to this system and gives it resilience, allowing it to meet growing domestic demands and to underpin future energy exports. I'll briefly summarize DeCarbonX and ESB plans in their three main project uh, areas or hubs offshore Dublin, Cork and Shannon. Firstly, Dublin, or more precisely, Pool Beg, the industrialised peninsula in Dublin Bay. Repurposing data and detailed subsurface analysis have identified thick 
offshore salt deposits conducive to salt cavern development in shallow water. In similar geology across the Irish Sea and the Cheshire Basin, natural gas has long since been stored in salt caverns, which now interest Innovin in their plans to store hydrogen for HiNet. DecarbonX assesses that offshore Dublin salt caverns would store up to 2.1 terawatt hours of green hydrogen energy. That would support the grid at five gigawatts for 18 days, whenever the winds are light across Ireland and its neighbours. Our second ESB DecarbonX project area is offshore Cork, and more precisely, the prospective subsurface storage assets are the reservoirs of the Kinsale cluster of fields. Here, offshore storage of 2.3 terawatt hours of natural gas was highly effective at the Southwest Kinsale field for 15 years from 2001. This depleted and now substantially decommissioned gas asset once stabilized Ireland's energy system. DecarbonX's proprietary studies point to the Kinsale reservoir storing more than three terawatt hours of green hydrogen and or hydrogen carriers in support of the Cork Harbour area green energy hub. We see this large scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage significantly balancing the energy system, restoring resilience, decarbonizing the nation and underpinning significant potential hydrogen energy export opportunities. Our third ESB decarbonX project area is in the west, offshore Shannon. Here ESB is repurposing a major thermal power station to transform Money Point into a green energy hub that integrates offshore wind energy, wind turbine construction, hydrogen production, and with DecarbonX, large-scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage. Our exploration studies have identified thick offshore salt sequences, which would be suitable for salt cavern construction. This will require advances in offshore salt engineering, much like those delivered by the engineers who decades ago solved the challenges from subsurface pioneers in the North Sea and Gulf of Mexico. At six terawatt hours, the scale of this ESB DecarbonX green hydrogen energy storage project is twice that it can sail. Whilst ambitious, it matches aspirations of those energy majors who are prepared to invest in Ireland within its upcoming regulatory frameworks. The goal is to tap this immense Atlantic wind resource and convey that renewable energy to decarbonize Ireland and thence to the continent using green hydrogen as the energy carrier. So subsurface storage is a strategic enabler from complementary perspectives. From left to right, we evolve from diverse decarbonization solutions at the gigawatt hour scale to the multi terawatt hour scale of an integrated hydrogen energy system. On the left, with a focus on power generation decarbonization, subsurface hydrogen storage helps deliver short term national targets. Then subsurface hydrogen storage ensures security of energy supply and delivers national baseload energy resilience affordably. Moving deeper into integrated decarbonization, subsurface hydrogen storage can deliver mid term heavy transport and industry targets. And ultimately, there are prospects for export driven economic prosperity underpinned by subsurface hydrogen storage. There's a great opportunity for Ireland and Britain to deliver sustainable clean energy at scale across Europe upon a future hydrogen infrastructure with embedded offshore subsurface hydrogen storage. So my conclusions. Hydrogen is a clean, versatile energy carrier, more of a high quality multi-tool to deliver the energy transition than a red herring or silver bullet. And large scale offshore subsurface hydrogen storage can deliver the energy transition, playing a central role as a clean, green and unseen strategic enabler of decarbonisation.
Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Angus. So I encourage people to pop questions uh, into the Q&A uh, window for Angus. Um, so while people start putting questions in, um, Angus, um, so you talked quite specifically about sort of a few Irish case studies there. Um, how scalable do you think this is for kind of other areas in the world? Well, we, we believe that um, this is the large scale solution for the future energy system. And as I said in the presentation, it's foreseen by um, many uh, energy economists that 25% uh, of the energy mix in 2050 uh, will be uh, underpinned by clean hydrogen. Um, so, you know, I, th I think we, sh we should be seeing this as, as a reality that's underway. Um, you see the commitment um, of the European Union to um, the hydrogen economy. You see the UK committed to it and uh, publishing its strategy. And I think you mentioned at the beginning, 30 uh, countries have published uh, their hydrogen strategy. So, you know, the hydrogen economy is coming. Um, it will uh, build its economies of scale as it grows. Uh, the price of hydrogen is crashing through these uh, industrial um, initiatives. Uh, and, and, and the answer lies in, in, in executing this um, hydrogen economy at scale. So it is very much going to be a global, global industry. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So. Um, questions come through so um one one question is obviously um when you're combining it with a wind as well and um then you have you're kind of thinking of multiple variables there it's not just the geology it's kind of those kind of wind conditions mm -hmm. has there been any studies at all that kind of marry these two together where you're kind of getting both optimum um obviously you have those irish case studies um do you know of anywhere else that is thinking of going down this avenue as well yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, Ireland and Britain are particularly um, well suited to this uh, green hydrogen, offshore green hydrogen uh, solution because of the very wind, windy conditions on this side of the Atlantic. But there are, there are other pl places in the world, obviously, uh, where you get the combination of, uh, of uh, high winds and, um, and salt deposits, thick, thick salt deposits. Um, and likewise, there are uh, uh, overlapping situations in the world where we have uh, strong um, solar energy resources uh, closely associated uh, with um, geological uh, resources, particularly salt, salt deposits. So indeed, you're right, you know, this will be a global opportunity um, overlapping the um, the, nat the modern uh, natural resources of wind and, and, and solar uh, with the geological resources uh, for uh, storage. Maybe I should just emphasize, you know, the importance of uh, storage in the uh, renewable energy mix because of the intermittency and the variability of, of uh, wind and solar resources. Um, they really do need to be balanced uh, to be useful at scale. In fact, you know, renewables can't grow to their uh, hoped for uh, levels without storage at scale. You know, they need storage at scale. And whilst uh, these activities um, may, may look, um, you know, costly, in fact, they're in the great scheme of things, when you look at the total hydrogen economy, the only amount to a few percent storage costs only amount to a few uh, percent of the uh, of the total uh, green hydrogen uh, expenditures. Excellent, thank you. So I've um, got a question come through, uh, starting to get a couple of questions, but one question is relating to um, what is the timing of hydrogen storage for base uh, load power generation versus other avenues such as small scale nuclear reactors? Well, the, the timing, we, we believe we can have these systems um, up and running on our projects around the uh, around 2030. Um, you know, the, the nu nuclear timeline, I believe the small nuclear is also looking for a quick, quick delivery, but of course, you know, um, the green hydrogen solution um, has uh, 
potentially a much lower uh, environmental footprint. As I say, we're going offshore, over the horizon, clean, green, un unseen, um, underground, subsurface, offshore. Um, so from a consenting point of view, and that's often a critical factor in uh, timelines, from a consenting point of view, uh, building um, an offshore um, subsurface uh, facility uh, has a has a lower impact on society than a uh, terrestrial uh, nuclear facility. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we've just got a couple of minutes spare, kind of at the end here, for kind of a wider discussion um, for for all panel members. If anyone's got any questions at all um, that you think might be a can be maybe answered by multiple. Um, panel members, so Richard, uh, Papuana and Angus. Um, so I suppose, um, you know, one big theme here seems to be uh, questions coming through about, you know, the transportation of of hydrogen and, you know, using existing infrastructure. Has anyone got any um, kind of opinions or thoughts on that um, in terms of pros and cons? Well, I can maybe just start by saying there's, um, you know, there is an opportunity to um, uh, mix um, uh, hydrogen into uh, natural gas uh, pipeline networks and to convey hydrogen to um, and distribute it through the market through existing natural gas uh, systems. Um, up to say 20% of hydrogen blended into, into natural gas uh, pipelines. So that's one way to expedite um, the, the large scale transportation of, of hydrogen. But ultimately it's going to require um, hydrogen, hydrogen infrastructure uh, that's purposefully designed for that, uh, including ships and, uh, and pipeline networks. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so I think we're getting towards the, the end of this, this initial panel now. So I'd first of all like to thank all our panelists here and for uh, discussions and questions that have been going on in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, it's uh, certainly a very interesting topic. Uh, as we've heard, it's both in its infancy and also not. Um, so, and lots of questions to still answer and, and debates to have. Uh, but it's certainly got potential as we kind of move forward. Um, so just to highlight now that we, we do have a, a break before we have our natural hydrogen panel um, from a, a variety of speakers. Um, just to also uh, advertise, we do have an in-person or public basin event um, this afternoon, um, but we're also going to be streaming that live. So I'll put the link for that into the chat momentarily. Um, to encourage people where we'll be tackling some of these themes such as public perception of the use of hydrogen, uh, further work on um, hydrogen storage, as well as the transportation of um, hydrogen in, in, in existing infrastructure. 